for Sciences, and on behalf of my college and Dean Henry White and the College of Science, welcome to the, the first Frontiers of Science lecture of 2019. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Turi Serling tonight, who uh, doesn't need a long introduction for, for this group, but I actually have three pages I have to go through. Um, so I'm going to do it, whether he likes it or not. Um, uh, Turi is a, a uh, what I'll, I'll call a biogeochemist, and he's a, um, uh, I won't call him a renaissance man, I don't like that term. Um, he's, he's what I would call transdisciplinary. And uh, he actually has a, a joint appointment in both uh, the biology department and the, and the department of geology and geophysics. He's a distinguished professor in both of those departments. Um, he is also the chair of the Department of Geology and Geophysics, and thank you, Turi, for doing that. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, he is also the, uh, the Francis Brown uh, Presidential Chair, uh, which is an endowed chair position in our college, and I consider it to be one of the, the most distinguished chair positions at the university. He's been with the University of Utah since 1979, uh, the year I was born. Uh, and I wish. And prior to that, he was um, with Shell Oil, Anaconda Company, and also Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, his work primarily concerns the use of isotopes to study uh, biological and geological processes close to the Earth's surface. Um, and uh, I'd say even though he loves being in the lab, characterizing materials, uh, his passion is to be out in the field. And he's uh, done field studies all over North America, Africa, uh, particularly in Kenya, uh, and some work in South Africa. He's also worked in Pakistan, Argentina, Australia, Western Europe, and the Antarctica. So uh, he's been a busy guy, to put it mildly. Um, as I said, his work is extremely diverse, and, and I only have one hour, um, so I'm going to kind of just summarize as briefly as I can. His work um, is, is kind of related to, I'd say, the geomorphology and chemistry of, of the Earth. Uh, he's worked on lakes and lake sediment, uh, dating of rock surfaces, for example, uh, establishing their cosmic ray suntan, so to speak. Uh, he's uh, worked on understanding lava dam bursts, flooding of the Grand Canyon, residence times of water and shallow groundwater, groundwater and groundwater mixing. I think that's work he's done with Kip Solomon, if Kip is here. Um, he's done a lot of work um, on dating and, and um, understanding the environments of early humans. Uh, or early hominin, and uh, a lot of that work was with Frank Brown. Uh, he's worked on projects for the National Academy on black lung disease and coal miners, uh, nuclear waste issues. He served on a number of very important panels uh, in that area. He's also worked on poaching of wildlife, which you're going to hear a little bit of about today. He's got a huge number of awards and accolades. It's really kind of embarrassing, actually. It's amazing. Um, he. Uh, I'm not going to go through it all. It's pretty incredible, uh, quite frankly. It's like two or three lives it takes to do this. Um, he's a, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, a fellow of the Geological Society of America, a fellow of the International Association of Geochemistry and Cosmochemistry. He's also been a visiting scholar or visiting professor uh, all over the world. Uh, including at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, Yale University, California Institute of Technology, the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, uh, Ecole Normale in Lyon, France, uh, University of Cape Town in South Africa, where he did a Fulbright Fellowship. And again, the list of awards is pretty impressive as well. Uh, he uh, won the, or received the Distinguished Research Award from the University of Utah. He's received a Uni Utah Governor's Medal for Science and Technology, um, the Geological Society of America President's Medal, and I attended that ceremony. Uh, that's a, a very important uh, award for our university. Uh, he also received the American Geophysical Union Excellence in Earth and Space Science Education Award, which I think is one of the things he's very proud of, which was with Jim Elringer. I don't know if Jim is, is here. Is Jim here? Yeah, so I think the two of them received that together, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, that was for their incredible work uh, training students in, in isotope uh, science. Uh, and very importantly, he's a member of the National Academy of Science, um, one of our, our few uh, academy members here at the University of Utah. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, one of the things that I know he's very, very proud of, and that is uh, the impact that he's had on young people 
Um, and one of the examples of that is uh, the training that he, he and Jim have uh, pursued over the last two decades with their ISO camp. They've trained more than 700 young scientists, in other words, an entire generation of scientists in um, what they like to describe as isotop topology. I'll call, you know, and I refer to these uh, individuals as ISO weenies um, uh, affectionately. Uh, it's a really an amazing camp, and, and um, they, they give these students a, sort of an experience that's unlike any other, um, and it's, I know it's impacted their lives tremendously. In fact, some of the individuals that have gone to, through this camp are now academy members themselves, which is quite a testament to, to the course and, and the students. Um, one of the things that I really like uh, or enjoy about Turi, though, is his storytelling, and uh, Turi tells stories in this really kind of humble Way and he observes the world and the earth, and, and this he's got this great way of observing the planet, and I, I just love hearing his stories. And uh, one of the one of my favorite stories is a, about a, a one-horned gazelle. And so if Tori ever runs into you and says he feels like a one-horned gazelle, it means he's had a bad day, and it probably means that someone has treated him unfairly. I'll let him tell you the story sometime, but. Uh, and uh, he's also uh, told stories about, for example, plucking hairs off the back end of elephants um, in order to characterize the isotopes, which uh, I'm a parent and I consider that to be a bad activity. And um, uh, it's also not approved in our field safety manual. Um, so, um, so speaking of stories, Turi, um, welcome to the podium and just sit back and enjoy. So Turi, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure who that was he was talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, just to get started, I've been, um, actually I gave a Frontiers of Science talk a couple of years ago on a very different uh, topic. And uh, somewhere through this talk, I'll try to make the link between that uh, subject and this. Um, I'm showing here a bunch of uh, elephants that I've worked with. I've been working closely in uh, elephant conservation with a group called Save the Elephants for the last 20 years. And these are a bunch of uh, nice, well, at least when, when my wife and I were in the field that, uh, that season, they, all of these were alive and well, obviously. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about a problem that uh, we've been involved in trying to understand the problem of uh, the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, elephant poaching has uh, taken off since I started working with elephants 20 years ago. Uh, and it, it's, it's reached, reached a really a bad, a bad state. So these are living elephants. Uh, we're talking about elephant tusks. Uh, elephant tusks are teeth. It's the same as your eye tooth, what they call our eye teeth. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, so it's just a, just a different shaped tooth. I'm going to switch now. I can figure out how to get out of this and into a different um, talk. You can, I think. Hello. And we don't want to start at the end. That's the punchline. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, this is uh, this is a left tusked elephant. Uh, elephants uh, use their tusks for all sorts of things. You saw some uh, big boys trying to push each other uh, through those slides that we were looking at the, at the beginning. Uh, they, uh, this one has a groove in the left tusk, and that's actually, uh, they use their tusks to help them get their food supply. So they, uh, they, try, they eat a lot of the food the way we eat spaghetti. You twirl it up on something, you break it off. They use their tusk to actually break off grass or or twigs or, or, or branches. And so this is a, a left tusked uh, a left tusked elephant. So this little thing here. Um, so my talk today is about uh, about um, ivory. Uh, what do we have here? It's in a different somehow it got in a bit of a different order. Uh, okay, it was supposed to start on ivory isotopes uh, and Interpol, okay? <laughs> uh, 
so we're, 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 we're on the, on the, the scheme now. Um, and so I'm, what I'm going to tell you about is some work that, uh, that a group of, uh, of uh, students and colleagues and friends have been working on uh, trying to understand uh, some aspects of the illegal wildlife trade. So, so this is me. Uh, you've already heard all of that stuff. Uh, this is uh, uh, work has been supported by a variety of uh, groups, the Paul Allen Foundation, Elephant Crisis Fund, uh, ISO Forensics, uh, Kenya Wildlife Service, uh, Save the Elephants especially, I've been working them closely with 20 years, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and of course, uh, much of this work has been done at, here at the University of Utah, and uh, we've actually uh, also done some work on the elephants uh, at Hogle Zoo as part of this. Um, so uh, some of the people who have been really helpful in this particular project include uh, Janet Barnett. Uh, she did a lot of the uh, extractions of the carbon-14 work that I'm going to be uh, talking about. Uh, Nancy Carpenter. Uh, we uh, had the opportunity of working with Nancy at the Hogle Zoo on, on one of the elephants that, uh, that was there. Uh, Leslie Chesson of ISO Forensics. Uh, Kendra Tritz was my graduate student and then uh, uh, it was at Smithsonian, uh, where she uh, helped us to get uh, samples uh, from the museums. Uh, Ian Douglas Hamilton has been a great uh, collaborator for uh, 20 years. Uh, when I first wrote Ian and told him about this crazy idea he had, he said, oh golly, that is going to be so much fun. And so we've been having fun for 20 years. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, Diego Fernandez uh, is, runs the... Uh, ICPMS lab in the, in the geology department. So when I talk about strontium isotopes, those are samples we're running through, the, through Diego's lab. Uh, Julio Tejada uh, is one of the ISOCAMP uh, uh, students who uh, happened to be at American, uh, American Museum of Natural History, and so she was helping us to get samples. Uh, Kevin Uno is a graduate student here. He actually did his PhD uh, on, uh, on, on what, an elephant that had died naturally. Uh, and, and we were able to develop a bunch of the techniques that then led to the rest of this study. He's now at uh, Columbia University and uh, is actually working quite a bit with the state of New York on, uh, on illegal ivory that is uh, in, the, in the state. Uh, Sam Wasser uh, does DNA studies. Uh, <clears throat> he's at the uh, University of Washington. And George Widemeyer, uh, also a long-term colleague. Uh, and this is George sitting at our camp uh, with uh, an elephant named Jaeger, who is a great friend of our, our uh, research area. Jaeger comes in and sleeps next to tents and snores loudly. You think <laughs> your spouse loud snores loudly. Wait, elephants can really do it. Uh, he got shot in the foot once, and so he came into our camp to recover and was there for about two months. Uh, he walked through our volleyball tent one night, and we never put it up again after that. <laughs> Uh, and I'd just like to mention in particular two people that I've been close collaborators with for uh, just about my entire time here at University of Utah, Frank Brown and Jim Elringer. Um, these are people that I've just enjoyed talking to and getting ideas, and uh, much of my career is, is a result of uh, the ideas that we spin off of each other. So, uh, and then dedication is, is to the living elephants of the, of the planet, and in particular, the friends that, that we've had uh, in Samburu National Reserve, where I've been working for about 20 years. Uh, and uh, they're not all alive anymore. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an animal that was, uh, was killed by poachers. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we've had to deal with a lot of that. So the background, uh, you know, you say, well, what is illegal wildlife trade? What's the deal? Uh, it's, it's a big it's a big, big business. It's on the order of uh, $20 billion a year uh, of uh, illegal wildlife products. It's not only elephants, it's many, many other things. In fact, the, the biggest wildlife trade animal right now is actually the pangolin. Uh, and, uh, and this, this, this uh, it, it is involved in the trafficking. The same people who do elephant uh, and other uh, illegal wildlife trade uh, material is uh, the same people involved in the trafficking of humans, uh, trafficking of drugs and the guns, and, uh, and 
So that's why it's of uh, such interest. The people who do the bad things in wildlife trade do other bad things as well. So there's a lot of linkages and that's why it's of great interest to uh, agencies such as Interpol and U.S. Fish and Wildlife and, uh, and any, of the, any of the various uh, uh, gun, uh, agencies. So the illegal wildlife trade uh, has um, been greatly on the rise in the really the last about 20 years, starting about the year 2000. Um, the demand primarily is uh, from Asian countries, principally China, but the U.S. is a very big player actually in illegal uh, trade of ivory. And any uh, trade in ivory in the U.S., uh, uh, unless you can document that the sample is at least 100 years old, is illegal. And there's actually quite a bit of illegal uh, ivory actually sold in the state of New York. Uh, it's mostly undercover. Uh, the problem uh, recently is that this now results in the deaths of uh, something on the order of 15 to 40,000 uh, elephants per year. Uh, that's a lot of animals and uh, it's estimated that there's less than 400,000 uh, left on the planet today. So that is not a sustainable uh, loss rate. Uh, and uh, uh, I, mean, I definitely would advise if you want to go see living elephants quickly, you know, book a ticket in the next couple of years and just go. It's, it, it, you, you will have a great, uh, great experience. Um, so there's been a number of uh, censuses, that have, censuses that have been done. The last really big census was in, uh, in 2016, and it was actually the first time that there was a comprehensive census of the entire continent using all the same methods by all the, all the different countries. Uh, and um, uh, this, uh, the, the study was able to document how significant the illegal killing of elephants was across the whole uh, continent. Now, most of the time, the actual killing of the animals is done by local individuals, but it's connected into much larger, uh, much larger uh, 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 trade networks. And uh, I'm not going to speak about it today, but some of the work that we're doing is trying to figure out how to link uh, these large ivory seizures uh, between some of the different groups. Uh, and if we find out that the same, uh, same methods are being used uh, by mul in, in, in these multiple seizures, um, it's a, it indicates there's probably some linkage um, somewhere up the line. So uh, uh, a number of these have been uh, directly linked to uh, terrorist organizations. It's, it's, it's often the same people. And so that's why there's um, uh, such interest in it. So um, again, the background material, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of money involved in this, uh, in this trade and it's not money that does very much good at the local level where the killing takes place. And so for instance, we, uh, Mahal and I have been in Samburu Reserve Park many, many times. There are you know, probably 100 or 200 local jobs that depend on that park. If that park loses its elephants, there is, there's no reason to go to that park, none. Um, so 100 people will lose their, will lose their livelihoods. And uh, the bad people, there's you know, probably four or five people who are, uh, who are uh, driving, the, the driving the killing. So we've been learning a lot about this, the, the, this problem uh, recently. Uh, this is a National Geographic article about a year, a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, there's, there's uh, um, plenty to be, to be learned there. So just with this background, um, I hope I've at least showed you that it's a, it's a major global problem. Um, it uh, it's, um, has the potential to, to wipe out an iconic species uh, on our planet. But what I'd like to do next is show you some of the work that we've been done, that we've been doing, and this was uh, initiated through uh, many conversations with the people at, uh, at Save the Elephants and the Elephant Conservation Fund, and then with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. How could the measurements that we do uh, with isotopes uh, uh, contribute to this problem? So that's what I'm going to try to try to try to get through. So. Um, my story today is going to be that I'm going to try to show you 
how we use isotopes to determine where and when an elephant died. And the issue is that this will help wildlife conservation uh, and the law enforcement if you issue, uh, uh, officers identify patterns uh, that then they can uh, use in their methods. And I'll just uh, make an aside here. Uh, the whole uh, study of forensics uh, is one in which we try to get many, many multiple lines of evidence to try to understand a larger, a larger picture. And there's usually no one uh, piece of evidence that, that solves the whole problem. We have to understand the whole picture. So this uh, is uh, just a slide of uh, one seizure of, uh, of ivory. There's a lot of tusks there. Uh, what I'll be talking about today are a large seizure is considered to be more larger than about a half a ton. And every ton of elephants represents uh, 200 uh, dead elephants contributing to that, uh, to that ton. And uh, every, uh, it, it, it's thought that the success rate is about 10%. Uh, so for every 10 one-ton seizures, uh, nine got away. So uh, every one ton of elephants, elephant tusks represents several thousand uh, dead um, individuals. Uh, the reason uh, for that is that uh, uh, the, the United Nations has actually uh, passed a uh, passed a resolu resolution saying that any seizures over half a ton should be investigated. Uh, and so those are the ones that we were, we were uh, looking at. And the reason is that the UN is the, actually the Office of Drugs and, uh, Drugs and Crime uh, that, that is interested in this because of the linkage to uh, other trafficking uh, things. So <coughs> uh, at University of Utah, we do a lot of isotope measurements in, uh, in this building up on the fifth floor. Uh, and uh, also over in the geology department. And so what we're gonna uh, do is, uh, in this talk, is I'll try to see how we use both carbon and strontium as tracers. And uh, the key is that uh, all elements in our universe are made up of isotopes, and isotopes uh, can represent unique tracers, so we can understand better how each individual element behaves. So the first thing I want to talk about is carbon. And we, uh, in the ecology and geology, worry about the carbon cycle. So the carbon cycle is simply how carbon moves around on the planet. And we can consider time scales on the length of, of the existence of our planet or something more on our lifetime. And considering on our lifetime, this is kind of the, the schematic carbon cycle. Carbon, we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's really important. We have sunlight coming from our great sun. And we have photosynthesis, which will take carbon out of the atmosphere. It'll uh, fix it into leaves. It'll fix it into solid wood products, and so on. Uh, some of that carbon will get eaten by uh, animals. And the animals will respire and send it right back. Uh, some of the, the carbon will uh, go into decay, and again, like the leaves from last autumn, they're decaying, they're going right back into the atmosphere. But some of it gets fixed into solid wood. That takes a long time until somebody uh, burns it up. And sometimes it lasts all the way till coal. Uh, coal is just old, it's just, it used to be atmospheric CO2. Uh, some of it gets dissolved into the oceans, and uh, that's of a large, uh, important problem consider with respect to the uh, to the uh, climate change issue. It's dissolving in the ocean. That actually changes the pH of the oceans and can result in ocean acidification. Some of it's fixed for a long time, turns into fossil fuels. The important thing is that the average molecule of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere lasts only about five years. And, would, and, and then it's either fixed in by plants or dissolved into the oceans. Some of it comes back fairly quickly. Okay, most of it actually comes back uh, uh, quickly, uh, but some of it takes thousands of years, some of it takes millions of years. 
what we want to look at is the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, it, and this is the stuff that's assimilated into plants. Um, and uh, then the animals uh, eat the plants. So now the CO2 has gone from the atmosphere into the plants, and now it's going into the animal's stomach. And eventually, it's the little, tiny little bit of it is going to end up in the elephant's tusk. So the concentration of carbon in an elephant's tusk is about 1% carbon. So there's a little bit in there if we can um, figure out how to trace it. So uh, going back to whenever you learn chemistry, first grade, second grade, whichever it was, <laughs> you learned the periodic table of the element and you learned that e elements are defined by the number of protons and one proton is hydrogen, two is helium. And by the time we get up to six, we're at, uh, at carbon. And so that's the one we're interested in. You can go all the way up to 92 where uranium is uh, here. And uh, beyond that are the transuranics that they try to make in accelerators and physics departments and so on. But you know we have a lot of elements, but now we're just focusing on carbon. Now what's unique about carbon is it has three different things we call isotopes. And the isotopes are just uh, different flavors, as it were, of carbon. And uh, we have these six protons inside the, the nucleus, and they're positively charged, and they have to stick together. And so the glue that holds them together is neutrons. And in, uh, in, in so we have six neutrons plus six protons equals 12 of these total nucleons. And 90, nearly 99% of the carbon on our planet is carbon-12. And we call it a stable isotope. It doesn't undergo radioactive decay. There's essentially as much on Earth today as there was when Earth formed. Carbon-13 has one extra neutron. It's a little bit rare. It's important. It's, it's made inside of, of stars that are more exciting than our own star. Because uh, ours is a boring star that can only burn hydrogen. Uh, and it's about 1%. And there's a tiny fraction of carbon that's carbon-14. And that's, I put 1 and 10 to the 12th. And Mahela said, nobody knows what 1 and 10 to the 12th is. What is 1 and 10 to the 12th? And so I said, oh. 1 and 10 to the 10th would be like one human on planet Earth. Because there's about 10 to the 10th humans. So it would be like 100 planets worth if there was 100 planets with uh, 10 billion people on each planet. And one of those was different than all the others, that would be like the carbon-14. So that's, that's the concentration of carbon-14. They're not much, but we can measure it. It turns out really well and really accurately in spite of having to separate it from all those other carbon atoms. Okay? So it's the carbon-14 that's of real interest, and there's supposed to be a one there that's kind of, you can't see. So it's not carbon-4 CO2, it's carbon-14 CO2. Um, so this is radioactive carbon. It's formed by cosmic rays. It's mainly formed uh, from the solar cosmic rays. So when we get a solar burst that you know, tries to put out our computers that, and makes beautiful northern lights, that's making carbon-14 for us. So that carbon-14 is made uh, by cosmic rays in our upper atmosphere. And it gets mixed into the whole uh, cycle. And we've, many of us heard of carbon-14 dating. And it's used extensively in archaeological materials. And uh, basically, uh, the older samples have less carbon-14 than younger samples. And uh, so what's actually measured when we, and what we actually do when we're doing carbon-14 dating in this traditional way is we say, OK, let's measure how much carbon-14 is in the sample. We know how much was in the atmosphere, what its concentration was when it uh, was uh, being a plant and photosynthesizing. And so we're simply measuring how long it's been since it was removed from the atmosphere. So a modern tree should have 100%. So a tree that's 5,000 years old should have half of that concentration. And one that has one quarter as much carbon-14 as a modern atmosphere would be 11,000 years old, and so on. So this is the traditional carbon-14, and that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> but you've heard of it. 
What we are talking about is carbon-14 that's not produced naturally. So about shortly after I was born, the United States and the Soviets decided to do the greatest geochemical experiment the planet has ever seen. And what they did was put a whole bunch of new stuff into the atmosphere. Okay, and so as geochemists, we say, well, this is an experiment. We're going to now take advantage of this because there's no way you could get permission to do this unless you're the military. Okay, so they put in radioactive helium, or radioactive uh, hydrogen, radioactive cesium, iodine, strontium, chlorine, and also they, we essentially doubled the concentration of carbon-14 in our just a couple of years. And this was the above grounds weapon testing, and that leads, that was the downwinder uh, issue. So here's just a graph that just shows the number of, not, no, actually the, the, the megatons of, uh, of, uh, of, of nuclear weapons that were exploded. And uh, I was born right back here. And uh, I remember growing up, as some of you well do, oh, we heard about strontium-90 and milk and all that kind of stuff. And, and of course, the downwinder problem here in Utah. And in the late 1950s, uh, the US, and so Eisenhower and Khrushchev decided that uh, they, we, we would ban all above ground weapons testing uh, effective the 5th of August uh, 1963, and certainly for Eisenhower, conveniently when someone else would have to deal with it, because he wouldn't be president anymore. Uh, and so, in about 1960, the U.S. and the Soviet uh, the military sort of said, wait a minute, we've got to do all of these weapons testing. So most of the weapons testing was done in a two-year period, just before the above ground weapons testing ban. There's a couple of sm these smaller tests are all other countries other than the US, China, <coughs> France, um, and, and, and so on. But the predominant thing was right there. So what did this do to carbon-14? This is what it did. Here we see this essentially doubling. So a fraction modern carbon means fraction modern carbon. 1.0 means 100%. So here we go, almost up to a factor of two. We almost doubled it. So tritium, by the way, radioactive hydrogen, was increased by a factor of more than 1,000. And uh, Kip Solomon uh, does a lot of work on using tritium, still using, uh, still using um, those radionuclides. But now we see this decline in radiocarbon in the atmosphere. So these are actual measurements that are made in a whole series of stations around the world. And this is the fall off to uh, basically today. So right down here, we're at about 1.04% modern carbon. And we can measure this to about five, about six decimal places. So we can still measure to plus or minus a few months, uh, even on this curve that's way, way, it looks like it's getting flat, but we can, uh, our measurement error is smaller than the thickness of that, that line. So what we decided we would do is well, can we use this then to determine the age of the tusk and what does that tell us? So this is just an example of an elephant uh, tusk. It's been cut in half. So this is the, what we call the pulp cavity. So this is uh, where the actual growing surface of the tusk is. So everything on this line that I'm trying to, on my, trying to draw with my laser is exactly the same age. So that's where the ivory is forming. And then the ivory grows out in this direction. So this is young, anything along this line, very young. And then this is older. And uh, this happens to be uh, a sample of ivory from the Hogel Zoo, from an animal that had died, died there. Well, we know exactly when this animal died. It died on, in September um, 2008. Um, so this is what we do, is we measure the carbon-14 down here we scrape off the youngest stuff that has just formed, and we get this number, 1.07 or 1.08, whatever that is. And you can see that it intersects the curves in two places. So this date means that it's either 2008 or it's 1956. Okay? 
So then what we do is we say, OK, well, now we'll go to this end of the tusk. We know this is older, so we can date it. And it's older, and here's the date, and it's either 1990 or it's 1957. So, uh, so we say, OK, this animal then, we know this sample was older, so we have to be on this part, this part on the curve. So if we, you know, to, to get past the conundrum of, well, which of the two intersections, we can always date two samples if we know the growth rate, the growth rate of the ivory. Uh, so this is the one that we just happened to have. We were interested in, well, exactly how fast does the, does the gr gr ivory grow? Is it growing constant rate? And this is kind of a test case uh, for us when we were trying to convince the people that, that, we, sh we, could, that we could do this study. Uh, so now um, I'm going to show you what we actually date for our large seizure studies. So we have all of these ivory tusks that are sitting around in these uh, stockpiles or in these, uh, in these ivory seizures in a customs agent. And what we do is cut a little almost domino. We call them dominoes, a little domino out of this end. You can see we've got the inside is when the animal's living and then a little bit of stuff on the outside. And uh, that's what we use. And so this is just an example. So this inside piece is what we use for dating the, dating the sample. So um, the question that we wanted to work on was, well, uh, uh, how can we help with the ivory trade? And the real issue uh, is a problem that we might call ivory stockpiles. So all the governments in Africa have large ivory stockpiles. Uh, this is the, uh, the iconic burning of the Kenya ivory stockpile in 1989. Uh, there was a bad poaching uh, uh, epidemic in, the, uh, in, in, in Africa in the 1980s. Um, Richard Leakey, uh, who many of you heard of through his anthropological interests, um, became director of Kenya Wildlife Service, and uh, he burned the ivory to make a point. He said, we're going to burn all this stuff. We don't want the money. Uh, all it can do is do bad things. Uh, and so uh, that iconic burning had a huge effect on the attitude that people had in both Europe and North America on ivory. And it kind of almost overnight became a thing you didn't want to have in your possession. So uh, it, it, it had a huge effect. Now, the linkage to the rest of my career actually is through Richard Leakey, because I've been rich working with rich Richard for some time. And uh, my introduction to Richard was when I was an undergraduate in 1971, and I went to East Africa for the first time and began working on early humans. So I've been working with Richard Leakey, Meve Leakey, and now their daughter, uh, uh, Louise Leakey, on uh, studying early human uh, things. And, and Richard was very influential with me because uh, I said, well, you know, some of the questions I want to answer in the geological past are about, about the wildlife that we can use with isotopes. And he says, OK, well, let's just start working. Use, use the national parks of Kenya. Use all of the, the dead animals lying around the landscape for your study areas. So I, I, started, I started working then um, with with the Kenya Wildlife Service, and I've been working with them now for uh, 25 or more years, and that's what led me to begin working with Ian Douglas Hamilton and Save the Elephants 20 years ago. Uh, so the poaching of elephants uh, subsided in the 1990s, but then it reared its ugly head again, starting about 2005, and it had to do with the improving of the economies of China, Cambodia, Thailand, and this became a desirable product uh, in those countries. Uh, and it was clear by 2010, and I remember being uh, in the field in, in, uh, in, in Kenya in 2010, and there's just lots and lots of elephants that were, had, had been slaughtered uh, for their ivory. And, and a couple of times, you know, I, with the people in Save the Elephants, you know, was the sort of first responder, uh, as it were. And it was really sad, because sometimes these are the elephants that we had been studying you know, for 10 years, and you know, we knew them as individuals, and they're, they're sensitive individuals. One of, the, one of the 
greatest experience Mahila and I had was one day we decided we're just going to watch elephants for a whole morning, and, and it was the elephants that we were watching in the slide through, the ones crossing the river. And there was a little baby about this size, and there was a river bank about this high, and there's no way this baby is going to get up that river bank. And so one of the big mamas came and put her two tusks underneath his stomach, and another one stood on top of the river bank and took her trunk and put it over the stomach. And together they lifted this one ton baby <laughs> up. Try that sometime. <laughs> uh, they're, they're just incredible animals. Anyway, um, so uh, elephant numbers were decreasing according to people in the field, but the arguments were being made. And, and until uh, last year, China, uh, it was legal to buy and sell ivory in China, in Hong Kong, and so on. And so the argument was, well, some people were saying, this is just old government stockpiles. It's the governments that are behaving poorly, and they're, all, they're selling their stockpiles. It's the government. It's the police themselves who are corrupt. And other people were saying, no, no, it's just bad people. Uh, uh, and this, these, are, these are recent elephants being killed. This is not these old ivory stockpiles. So we wanted to answer these questions. So, so both would be illegal because the CITES rule, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, had said that any elephant after 1989 was illegal. It could not be traded internationally. You could still trade legally within your own country, but you could not trade internationally. Uh, <coughs> so both of these would be illegal, but it's a totally different approach to who's the problem. Is the government, you know, are all these African governments the bad ones, or is it other individuals? So this is the Kenya ivory stockpile. Uh, that's sort of typical of things. And uh, so we were tasked uh, as to trying to figure out, is this coming from ivory stockpiles? And if it is coming from ivory stockpiles, uh, it's, it's probably going to have a wide variety of age, ages. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, I guess the other thing is, uh, well, it'll, it'll have a wide variety of ages. Uh, and, and, uh, and if it's actually coming from recently killed animals, it should be, uh, hope it, it, it should be a tight distribution of ages and, uh, and, and, and so on. So um, we started working uh, with Sam Wasser, who is uh, working with the genetics uh, on, these, uh, on these samples. He's trying to figure out where they come from, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the bottom line, here's what we found studying 14 different seizures, is it's all young. If it's coming from West Africa, it has an average age of 12 months between the time the animal died and when it was seized by customs in some other country. Some of that has to be transit time. East Africa, the same. It's all, it's all a year or so less. Zambia, a year. Uh, the tritum, this area here in in Africa, a few more years, but, but not many. So th these are anything we looked at. We only found one ivory tusk older than six years in all of the samples we looked at. And we looked at hundreds of samples. So these are all young animals dying. And this really solved the problem. This is just a whole bunch of these, uh, the different seizures and where they're uh, coming from. And uh, so we. We wrote, this was published about two years ago in the, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and all of this stuff is too young to have been stolen or leaked from the government stockpiles, and so this really means the focus has to be uh, not on, the, on policing the police, but on figuring out who the bad people, and these killing rates are enormous, and, uh, and this solved a, a major problem, and one of the great, just gratifying things to me was that about uh, six months after this, the Chinese government changed their law and said, that, okay, starting in 2019, December, I mean, uh, January 1st, 2019, so just earlier this month, they're going to cease the legal trade of ivory in China. And I was told that this had a major effect on them making that decision. And that's, a, that's one of the great things in science, if it feels you can actually uh, make a difference on those issues. Uh, and this, uh, this particular animal, uh, which was the sort of the iconic elephant of Savo National Park, uh, was killed uh, for its ivory, and, and the ivory was not re recovered. 
Okay, so that's a large scale. Um, we could look at individual scales. Um, so here's, uh, here's a smaller scale problem. Uh, here's, a, here's just two ivory carvings, uh, ivory tusks, uh, that were seized by the Canadian government. Uh, and, uh, and so the question was, are these legal or illegal? So CITES banned the trade in 1989, but Canada has a different rule than any trade in Canada of ivory, uh, the, 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 the animals must have died before 1975. Um, and uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is actually Kevin Uno, my, f my former student, uh, working on, on, uh, on ivory samples. Uh, and uh, what we do is ex take a little bit of uh, a sample, get it into this form, uh, figure out how to get it to Janet Barnett, <laughs> and, uh, and date these for carbon-14. So this is the, uh, the, the Canadian uh, rule. Is, so the, the um, international rule for international trade is 1989. For Canada, is any ivory must be older than 1975. And in this case, uh, the ivory actually was demonstrably uh, illegal, got these wrong, okay. Legal, illegal, sorry. <laughs> Fix that. It's the first time I've given this talk. Um, and again, this was, you know, th this actually led to a conviction uh, in the Canadian courts. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, it, it, it's gratifying when you feel like your work uh, is actually uh, making a difference. Okay, uh, the last um, thing that I'd like to go over is the work we're trying to do and how we can help figure out where the animals come from because we've now been able to show we can find out when the animals died. How do we do the next step and figure out, uh, uh, figure out the next thing? Uh, DNA is, is often cited as you know, the magic uh, bullet and DNA will solve everything. It turns out DNA is useful but doesn't, doesn't quite do the whole way. So um, my colleague Sam Wasser at uh, University of Washington uh, is, uh, is a DNAologist. And uh, what he does is goes around and manage, collects elephant poop. And from dung, you can extract the DNA of the animal. And uh, so he uh, does what we call DNA fingerprinting, uh, so you uh, look at short sequences uh, in, 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 the, in the, the DNA structure, and uh, uh, from this um, sort of makes a, 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 a map, as it were, of elephant um, populations. Uh, so uh, the, the notion then is that if we know what the elephant distribution on the continent of Africa is, we could use, the, we, if we can extract uh, DNA from ivory, uh, then we could uh, tell about where it's from. Uh, the problem is, is the bottom line here, is that the, geni the genetic screening gives you a diameter of about 600 kilometers. So that's about the size of Utah. So Utah is, uh, I think, 800 kilometers tall. Okay, so it's almost the size, so it's about the size of Utah. So the genetics helps, it may put you in the right country or at least the right part of Africa, but Africa is a big place. Uh, and so here's a map of where they've gotten samples from. They've gotten lots of forest elephants. And uh, by the way, the forest and the savanna elephants are now considered to be different species. Uh, um, and so they've got samples from all over. And so they can say, okay, well, uh, ivory comes from somewhere. I'm going to just use an example, one, one, just one sample to show what we're doing. This is a geological map of Kenya, and it's the geology that turns out to be really important uh, in this story. So we're going we're to take the DNA fingerprint, and we're going to add uh, geology to the, to the story. Okay, so uh, this, uh, the, the example I'm going to use is one that's known as the Pili seizure from uh, 2011 in Kenya. It's called the Pili seizure. Uh, Pili in Swahili means uh, pepper. 
And uh, with this, uh, these ivory samples had been strongly dosed with hot red peppers. And the reason is they wanted to fool the dog, the sniffing dogs, and it didn't work. Um, but the Pili seizure is for Pili Pili hot red pepper. Um, so um, in any of these seizures, uh, the, you sort, sort the ivory. Uh, so this is actually an important thing. And this is done by the people interested in the genetics because uh, you can see these two samples almost certainly came from the same individual. Likewise, these two, so they try to match them so that they only have to analyze half the number of samples. Uh, and then we, they do the DNA and say, okay, we've got all these samples uh, that are coming from these areas, and then we'll selectively say, okay, well, let's look at those samples, uh, say, that are coming from near the Kenya-Tanzania uh, border, and what can, we, what can we say about them? And I'll just uh, add, uh, there are other measures as well. Uh, sometimes things have, uh, are packaged similarly, writing, and these are the other issues that we work with other agencies that I'm not I'm going to talk about today, but to try to link these different seizures. Uh, if you've got a seizure in Hong Kong and another one that is in uh, Singapore, and both of them are in exactly the same kind of rice bag um, because they're just little fragments of ivory, you suspect, ah, perhaps those are related. And then you can use the shipping records to see if, oh, it turns out both of those things had crossed uh, ports at some point. Um, so uh, back to our, our sample. Uh, these are, so this uh, one is one of these dominoes. Turns out the genetics are best from the outside of the sample. There's a thin area called cementum, which is uh, much gene more genetically rich than the rest of the sample. We're actually interested in the youngest stuff. So this is ivory uh, grows at such a rate that the amount that we took off here represents the last three months, three or four months of that animal's life. So this thing is about two years thick. <clears throat> and we can actually take the carbon-14 and we can actually show that at what gro growth rate these are going because we can tell the difference of things a year apart. Uh, so we take this for our uh, carbon-14 and then we also do that for the strontium isotope analysis. So uh, here's the DNA uh, thumbprint, as it were. Uh, so it looks small on a map of Africa, but Africa is about twice the size of North America. And so now we'll move to strontium. So strontium uh, is also in the periodic table. It right, lives right there. And uh, it's a neighbor of rubidium. And uh, what we're going to do is look at specific isotopes of strontium and see how we can, uh, we can add to the, to the story. Uh, so the bottom line is related to this. Uh, there's uh, three isotopes that we're interested in. Rubidium-87 is, is radioactive, and it has a half-life of 49 billion years. And you heard that right, 49 billion. Our universe is thought to be 14 billion, so this is a really slowly ticking over radioactive isotope. Okay, but in even a thousand years, we can, enough of it decays into strontium-87 in the right circumstances. We can date things even over a thousand years old, given, given Diego's wonderful help in the isotope lab. So the rubidium-87 turns into strontium-87. And then we compare it to strontium-86. Okay, strontium-86 is a stable isotope. There's as much strontium-86 on this planet as there was when our planet formed. Okay, so we're not adding any occasional meteorite coming in as the only addition of strontium. So it's stable, but the, the strontium-87 is building up over geological time. And uh, in this slide, this, uh, these, these samples, this is Tsavo National Park, which is an area that is very old uh, potassium and rubidium rich rocks. So there's been a lot of time for the rubidium-87 to turn in to strontium-87. This is a young volcano called Kilimanjaro, and this is a very young volcano. It's actually very poor in rubidium and potassium, uh, and uh, it's rich in, in strontium, 
And so it has not had, there's been very little time for any rubidium to turn into strontium-87. So going back to the geological map, it turns out this geological map uh, is, according to our idea, uh, a map of strontium-87 to strontium-86 ratios. So working with the national parks, uh, again, starting with Richard Leakey when I first approached him, to do other things, it turns out we could use the same samples uh, to uh, essentially uh, map all of the geology of Kenya uh, with, strontium, with strontium isotopes. So uh, we take the same samples and uh, look at them. And in this particular case, uh, we've determined the range. And uh, there's a lot of story in there that's been simplified uh, uh, for the talk. But the bottom line is quaternary volcanics, Kilimanjaro, looked like this. Uh, oh, and that, this is where Pili number 25 lands. Uh, might be tertiary volcanics, cannot be these sediments, cannot be these granites, cannot be these other, this basement, cannot be these samples um, either. So um, let's now go back to the particular location uh, that we had. Uh, there's our bullseye. The other thing to remember is also that elephants are not everywhere. There's been a lot of areas where elephants have been eliminated from their home range, just like in Salt Lake City, uh, most of the wildlife has been eliminated from some, I was actually reading uh, just uh, uh, this weekend about some of the early people. There were actually bears in Salt Lake City in 1850, which I hadn't realized they actually had bears, a bear problem here. Um, uh, so like, uh, so much of Africa today, the elephants have been eliminated. So it also means we, you know, these white areas, we don't need to worry about animals coming from those areas. Um, so here's our bullseye that looks pretty tiny and is total, the bullseye is totally centered in the orange. Uh, but uh, the true area of the bullseye is all of this area. So that's our 600 kilometer uh, circle uh, that when, where we're looking. Uh, we can make an elephant range map. It turns out that more than half of the area is eliminated because we don't find elephants there. We have cities and, and farms and things in all of those areas. So we don't need to consider those um, particular areas. And, uh, and so now we're back to the question, which of these two areas? Well, it actually, I told you, it's the young volcano. It's the young volcano area. And so now the geological screen says that it's either this area way over in a place called Manyara National Park or Amboseli National Park. Uh, and so now with the Pili seizure, we've looked at a bunch of animals that are all supposed to be coming from right around here, and they're all of them, see, not all of them, but, but about uh, 60 or 70 percent of them seem to be coming probably from this one national park, from Amboseli National Park. A few from Savo Park, which is a surprise because we had thought that was a, a major park. None from this pinky uh, national park uh, called Shimba Hills. Um, uh, so um, our, our conclusions in this case is that it's coming from this area of Quaternary Volcanics, and that pretty much means most likely coming from one particular national park and definitely could not have come from these other three national parks because we've characterized them and no samples look, have, the, have, that isotope, have that isotope ratio. The, the number we got for the ivory was 0 0.7049, so it's right in this range that we have for this park, not these other parks. So what we're doing now is trying to extend this to the whole rest of Africa. We want to um, see what we can do with these different samples. Uh, for those, we're mostly working with museums where it's where Tuli Ahada and uh, Kendra Tritz have been enormously helpful and trying to uh, map those. And, uh, and, and, and we're, having pretty, we're having really quite good success on that. But that's for another, another day. So just in, uh, in summary, I hope I've uh, uh, made you miss your dinner and, uh, and told you a good story instead. Uh, but uh, we can use isotopes to look at illegal wildlife. 
Um, actually, with the group at Isoforensics, we also look at it in for, uh, for human forensics problems. The reason Jim Elringer isn't here is he's actually at a trial uh, right now uh, talking to people. Uh, it could be used for charcoal. Illegal charcoal is a huge problem. Is actually the principal uh, funder of the Al-Shabaab that you've heard of that caused the bombing in Nairobi last week. Their principal source of funds is from illegal charcoal. Uh, illegal cycads is a problem that occurs in South Africa. So our student, a former a graduate student here in, uh, in the biology department, Adam West, is at University of Cape Town and he's actually using strontium isotopes to, to understand the illegal cycad uh, trade in, in that country. So we can do, do, a, do a lot of things. Uh, anyway, so uh, in summary, uh, I, uh, I, I've had a very interesting time uh, doing all of these different things that uh, Daryl uh, told you about. <laughs> and I'm still working on about half of them, or perhaps more than half. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> So we have, uh, I think, time for 10 or 15 minutes of questions. And um, we like to try to capture your voice in the microphone, but it's a little awkward. So if, if I can give you the microphone, great. But if I can't, just speak loudly and we'll repeat your question. So any, any questions for Terry, for Dr. Serna? No. <laughs> yes, I thank you. Great talk. My question is about the graph of carbon-14. It doubles and then it drops off so steeply, but it has a, such a long half-life. Why does it drop off so It fast? drops off quickly, or it drops off at the rate it does, which is relatively quick rate of half-life, because it's being removed in the carbon cycle. Some of it is being made into, into tree rings. So that is being removed quickly and not being recycled. So it's the carbon, that carbon cycle that we're, that we're considering. So the atmosphere is um, what's made in the atmosphere and then how it participates in the carbon cycle. So these other, there's these other uh, processes that are, are taking it out by reasons other than radioactive decay. Other questions? Yeah, Max. Uh, what's, the level, what's the level of accuracy in terms of your dating method? So the dating is pl about plus or minus about three months. So except that in the steep part of the curve, it's even better than that. So right now for, you know, for where the curve is beginning to flatten out, it's about three, three to six months depending on how everything went in the lab. So a bad one would be plus or minus six months, a good one would be plus or minus three months. And on the steep part of the curve, we're much, much better than that. What the question is, what is Kenya doing about the slaughter of the elephants? Uh, a, a lot, Kenya is one of, the, one of the leaders and it's actually one of the, the really, really on the front lines because um, the, again, the Al-Shabaab, I said most of their money comes from the charcoal trade, but, but the Al-Shabaab guys are also interested in the ivory. So uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service uh, has, a, has a very, very active anti-poaching group. When Richard Leakey was in charge, it was really, really, it was even more active than it is now, but the, not many people have his energy uh, even, even today at, at his age of 75. Uh, but so th they have a very active group on that. One of the things that um, we're working with, we mainly, the, the, um, the Save the Elephants group is trying to educate the judiciary because the judiciary, uh, it's key that when they convict somebody, they give a sentence that really means something. So I recall a case where somebody had been caught with a hundred ivory tusks, and he was fined one hundred dollars. Well, that's not much of a deterrent. So, part of the 
and, and, and their judiciary is much better now than it was 10 years ago. Uh, so that's one of the things. One of the other things that I really love is a group called Wildlife Direct, uh, uh, headed by Paula Kahumbu, and she is working with, um, with communities to educate uh, Kenyans about really how significant and how important our wildlife is uh, because, you know, you know, like even like here in Salt Lake, I'm every once in a while surprised that there's, I find people who've never been to any of our national parks. In Kenya, many of the, the, Af the, 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 the indigenous Africans haven't been to some of their national parks, so Paula is really working on educating them, and that really helps. Another thing that Kenya Wildlife Service has done is uh, make sure that some of the gate receipts go back to the communities to do useful things like build hospitals. So if the local people can see that the wildlife gives them a benefit, then they're much more interested in protecting wildlife. The, the question is, how important are the tusks for their diet? Uh, they use them a lot. It, it's, I mean, if they, there are tuskless animals and they do just fine. In fact, they're getting to be more and more, especially tuskless females in the African elephant population. In the Asian elephant population, there's virtually no females that have tusks. And that was, that was an evolutionary trend that was pushed by human poaching of elephants or killing of elephants in in Asia over the last several hundred years. Uh, so you, you know, they don't, you know, if, they're, if, if they don't have the fork that they're using, you know, to break it off, they can figure out something else. So it's, it's not a critical aspect of, of their life, but it's certainly for the male elephants, it's really, really important. If you're a male elephant and you don't have fists to do your fighting, you're not gonna participate in the wonders of <coughs> sex. <laughs> so, yeah. Is there much difference in the level of poaching in some of the big game reserves over in Africa versus the national parks? Are they protected and have about the same? Uh, the, the, so the, the question was, are national reserves different than national parks? And the answer is every place has its individual issues. Where we are in Samburu, National Reserve. The closest big town to us to the east is Mogadishu in Somalia. So there's a direct path. Uh, other, Maasai Mara has a whole bunch of reserves and parks in between. So each one is affected by the local uh, surroundings. And you know, so, so Kenya, where I've principally done my work, okay, we've had Sudan, has its civil war. Ethiopia's had its civil war. Somalia's had a constant civil war for the last 30 years. And so that whole northern umbrella of the country has just been a war zone for 30 years. And so when you're near those zones, um, more bad things happen than when you're in areas that are, are, are further from those. So I'd say it's really more the proximity to uh, failed states and there are a number, I mean, Congo, the DR Congo is a failed state. And so, you know, the, anything near those areas are under really high stress. So, yeah. So all of these, so it depends on which sample that we're doing. So for our general surveys uh, of samples, uh, I don't actually work on ivory. I work on other parts of elephants, and those are easier to get export, import permits for. The ivory is a bit tricky. But when we're working with the Interpol group, uh, then um, all of that material uh, actually is mostly processed through University of Washington. So they have a large, uh, good working relationship with Interpol. So it goes to the University of Washington, and then it's inside chain of custody here. So the Canadian samples were really interesting, and we've been trying to work with Hong Kong for some time. So, Can so it's, even though the, it's, it's ivory, and we're working with the police departments, we could not export 
ivory samples across the us canadian border. So what we did is we called up our buddies and said, okay, you have an isotope lab? And we know, I mean, all, all of us have isotope labs. So we said, will you please do the following treatment on the ivory in Canada? You just make it into carbon dioxide. You send us the carbon dioxide, okay? Then we give the carbon dioxide to Janet. Janet makes it into pure elemental carbon and we can analyze it in the accelerator at the, we work with the University of, of uh, California, Irvine. So it begins, yes, it becomes sometimes cumbersome. So a project I'm starting right now with uh, my friend Paula Kahumbu, we call Kids and Goats for Elephants. So we're trying to work with communities that just collect as samples of their local goat. <laughs> you know, and you have your goat at Christmas time for your, you know, Christmas dinner. You know, keep a tooth. Or just collect hair, send us, send us the hair from your goats. And then we can sample the entire countryside irrespective of geology. And it turns out goats have a, a home range that's not as big as an elephant, but it's not all that diff, it's, it's close. So we, you know, to actually make the geological strontium maps, we don't actually have to have ivory. So we have to just, you know, <coughs> figure out other ways around the problem. In the words of Lewis Carroll, you do all you know when you try all you don't. We have time for more questions. Uh, uh, Dino. Thanks to a prior question. How do you feel about uh, detesting as a preventive measure? Uh, how do I feel about detesting as a preventive measure? It doesn't work. Not feasible. Uh, well, well, let's say uh, we, this was done in Kenya with an animal called mountain bull. Is one of the biggest uh, tuskers in the country. Uh, they cut off the tusks. Half the tusk is still inside the jaw. So he was killed six months later, and the, uh, the other half was taken out of his jaw. So you can't, it's a little more difficult than pulling out one of your teeth. Um, so. So the, if the tusks are teeth, do they ever harvest the teeth out of the, out of the elephant? Well, you can't really, I mean, no. Um, but it's just one particular tooth. I mean, it's not the molar teeth, it's the incisor tooth. And it grows continuously through the life of the animal. And actually, the whole story of elephant teeth is very interesting. The other teeth do not grow continuously. Uh, uh, they, they have three molars and three premolars, just like we do, but they come in sequentially, like a conveyor belt. But the conveyor belt, not a conveyor belt, but like an escalator, but except that when they run out at the bottom, they're gone. So when the sixth of those teeth is used up, um, they don't. But no, they, there, there's not a program I'm aware of harvesting. People have tried this with rhinos, cut off the rhino, rhino horn. Rhino horn is, again, it's mainly used as, a, as an aphrodisiac. It's, I mean, with ivory, it's mostly used for uh, jewelry and ornamentation things. Uh, some of the other, the pangolin trade is, uh, is for, um, you know, traditional medicines. Uh, and, you know, pangolin is just an animal about this size, and they're getting, they're getting seizures of up to six tons of pangolins, which is, you know, thousands of animals that have been killed for that, for that seizure. And pangolins are important, and they're part of the, the cycle. Jack Longino is here, I saw, who studies ants, because pangolins Penguins are great ant harvesters. Um, yeah. Is the question is is there an illegal a similar illegal trade in ill in uh, things like walrus tusk? My, it's um, I would say yes. Uh, the people from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife in Oregon uh, say that oh well they've got lots of this uh, scrimshaw that they. You know that that all came from their grandfather who died, you know, 30 years ago or 50 years ago, and the, the, that grandfather must have had an awful lot of stuff. <laughs> and there's an awful lot of dead walruses that don't have any tusks. But uh, the problem is the carbon-14 dating of walrus ivory is a different story because you have because the walruses are living in the ocean, and the ocean 
sees the atmosphere in a different way. And so we've discussed with US Fish and Wildlife a possible project to figure out how to, how to date the walrus ivory, but it's not as straightforward as this. But yeah, so one story is there's an awful lot of grandpa's walrus ivory that's on the market. <laughs> At the back. Do I, the, the question is, do, the question is about the, 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 the stockpiles in different countries. Uh, uh, I mean, my, I mean, if you want to address the problem, you need, basically you need to get, if you start selling that, and there was one legal sale of ivory that was pushed through by South African Zimbabwe, and it just makes these kind of measurements very difficult to, to, to interpret. If you have just a little tiny bit that was legal, then suddenly you've got, you know, the story of the loaves and the fishes. Boy, can they ever expand into something and then with the walrus hive, everything happens to have come from that little tiny, tiny illegal sale. And the problem is it's actually, yeah, it, it, for each individual country and stockpile, it's actually not that much money. You know, yeah, maybe it's $20 million, but their economies are way, way huger than that. And if they have a healthest, healthy tourist industry, it's gonna be, it's gonna give them a lot more benefit than a one-time sale, and then the elephants become extinct. At least that's, that's my take on it. If you had somebody from South Africa or Zimbabwe or Botswana, they would have a different take. And in those three, not those three, in, in Botswana and in South Africa, they, have actually, they do have elephant overpopulation problems. Uh, because they, and they are so far from where most of the illegal wildlife trade uh, originates. Most of it seems to be coming from uh, East Africa. Um, that's, that seems to be the source of it. Of course, that's also where still most of the elephants, uh, you know, most of the elephants today are in uh, Tanzania and uh, Mozambique. Can you read one more question? Yeah. How many countries is it still legal to, to buy? Uh, I don't know how many countries there are. I will tell you one group, so I do a lot of work with Save the Elephants, uh, and one of the things they have done uh, in China, uh, one of the most popular people in the country is Yao Ming, remember the basketball player? Uh, so Yao Ming has been to our camp, uh, and he makes, he makes uh, advertisements for, for, for local television. They've worked with some of the actresses and so on, and, and so they, what really, one uh, method is to get sort of popular uh, uh, Hollywood, as it were, figures uh, to make statements because just like in America, people believe Hollywood figures uh, and, and, and take, take, their, take their cues from them. Um, so that's some of the things that's being done in those countries. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, sort of, you know, they'll say, well, we've been doing this for a thousand years. And it's true, they're doing it for a thousand years, but they didn't used to have, you know, two billion people. So. Let's take one final question. Okay, one final, Anthony. Uh, have they tried or have they ever thought about relocation or repopulation of elephants in different areas of Africa? Uh, I mean, there are, there, are, there, there are some relocation things that have gone on. It's certainly been a very big deal with the rhinoceros, but not so much with elephants. Actually, you know, talk about NIMBY. Nobody wants an elephant in their backyard. <laughs> if there's, yeah, that is NIMBY, NIMBY extreme. I will take this one, one question here, and then, 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 then I'll be around that. Yeah. How might migration patterns affect the precision of, you know, your isotope locating tech? techniques? That is a super great question. <laughs> so um, most, let's say young elephants do not migrate very far, have a fairly small home range. 
the female uh, elephants, so elephants live in families and they're matriarchal families, so there's usually about sort of five to 10 adult females who know everything and they teach the young ones things and they also usually have fairly small home ranges. So most of the time, our method would be fairly good for them because they don't wander hundreds of miles. The males do. So the males sometimes will wander 100 miles looking for, you know, something. So the males usually get kicked out of the families when they're about eight years old. And they're on their, they're, then they join another group about their age. And they wander around and they get beat up by the bigger old males to learn their manners, to learn how to behave. Uh, and, but and they'll sometimes go a long, long way and they often will end up in quite a, quite a different spot. What's happened more and more recently is because the landscape is more and more fragmented. It's actually harder for them. So every green place I showed is kind of a safe place, semi-safe. The areas that were not green on the map are often dangerous to travel between. So nowadays, there's less and less travel between those separated areas. So the, the individual animals are getting restricted to smaller and smaller areas, in many cases, areas, areas that they don't like. And one other thing, when we say, oh, elephants can have that land, it's often we're giving them, as we've done with so many times in the past, we give them stuff we don't want, and they don't want it either. So we'll give them, oh, you can have all of this. Give them the top of a mountain. They don't want the top of a mountain. They live down in the valleys that's where the grass is and, and where, the, where the rivers are. Um, so to give, you know, to give them the most worthless land uh, is, is a bit of a problem. But, so it is a bit of a problem. It's getting to be, but, but not as much as you might think because most elephants don't travel very much, very far, but there are a few who will just you know, go off and they'll be, you know, in three days they'll go 100, sometimes 150 miles. Okay, well I was gonna ask Dr. Serling to tell the story about the one-horned gazelle, but we don't have time for that. So let's, uh, let's thank him for that presentation. And, um, and I'm, he'll stick around for just a few minutes afterwards if you have questions. Um, our, <coughs> I think our next Frontiers lecture is February 26th, so we'll see you all in about a month. Heartbreaking in many ways.